Всім доброго дня, хто до нас доєднався. Будемо розпочинати наш захід. І від імені Національної психологічної асоціації хочу теж подякувати всім нашим колегам за те, що цей рік стійкості дозволив нам працювати, що ми змогли допомогти всім нашим людям та і всім, кому потребували підтримки. Буду передавати далі слово нашим організаторам. Вітаю, друзі! Сьогодні для нас емоційно непростий день, а рік того, як почалася Велика війна, яка триває вже багато років, вправді. І як психологи ми знаємо, як важлива, якою важливою є наша робота сьогодні. І Національна психологічна асоціація протягом цього членського року робила дуже багато для того, щоб підтримати кожного з вас. Ми організовували лекції, супервізії, ми проводили спільні заходи, ми допомагали вам з працевлаштуванням. Ми знаємо, яку важливу роботу ви робите. І сьогодні я маю честь представити вам лекцію і нашої шановної Ненсі Маквілімс, яка є однією з найбільш улюблених українських, яка є найбільш улюбленим психологів серед українських психоаналітиків, клініцистів, взагалі практикуючих психологів. Ненсі насправді надавала дуже велику підтримку в Україні з перших днів повномасштабного вторгнення вона допомагала нам у створенні нашої лінії психологічної допомоги ГБА. І е, лекція, яка, яку ви почуєте сьогодні, вона була запланована достатньо давно, і ми чекали на неї. І я дуже рада, що сьогодні вона відбудеться, і ви зможете почути нашу живу легенду наживо спеціально для НПА і для психологів України. І я хочу подякувати своїм колегам Мар'яні Великодній, модераторці дивізіону психоаналітичної психології та психотерапії, та Олександру Люпісу, які з інтернет... міжнародного дивізіону, є завдяки яким, власне, цей захід став можливим, тому що саме вони допомогли а, разом з дівчатами з тренінг тім організувати сьогоднішній захід. І я передаю слово Мар'яну тобі. Бажаю приємної перегляду. Я хочу сказати буквально кілька слів. Хочу висловити слова вдячності Ненсі Маквілямс за те, що ви сьогодні з нами і за те, що ви були з нами впродовж цього року. Сьогодні я розміщувала вкотре оголошення про те, що сьогодні відбудеться така лекція. І мені було цікаво побачити, як колеги поширюють стрімко це в своїх соціальних медіа і додають коментарі про те, що ви одна з тих, хто символізує ось цю потужну підтримку наших колег по всьому світі. І це дуже важливо, оскільки, на жаль, в цьому році ми також пережили багато розчарувань, коли наші вчителі, наші колеги, на жаль, були неоднозначними або однозначними в негативному ключі щодо того, що відбувається, зайняли таку болісно нейтральну аналітичну позицію, не втручання, мовчання. І на тлі цього те, що ви не просто погодилися виступити, а що погодилися виступити саме в таку дату, розуміючи, що це буде захід приурочений до того, що ми переживаємо через війну, це для нас дуже багато значить. Тому я радію, що сьогодні мої колеги по всій Україні зможуть почути вас, і в тому числі ті, хто виїхав за кордон, і в них є ця можливість онлайн почути слова підтримки. Просто дуже рада цій можливості. І також хочу сказати, що тільки завдяки ось такому асистуванню Олександра Люпіса да, цей, цей захід став можливим, що ми вийшли на зв'язок одне з одним, що ми змогли комунікувати так багато, і ось ця підтримка, така плече, я би навіть так сказав, сиблінгове плече, це дуже цінно. Дякую і прошу. Можливо, Олександр щось хоче ще додати. Дякую, Маріана. Дякую, колеги, це велика гонор говорити з вами сьогодні. Я відбував NPA after the war started. And I've spent many months contacting university psychology departments and psychotherapy institutes around America on behalf of different NPA initiatives. My inquiries in America have consistently been met with strong interest in learning 
about how you are working during the war and also a strong interest in how American psychologists can contribute to make NPA and psychology in Ukraine even stronger. This event today is an example of how the war has mobilized and inspired psychologists in America and Ukraine to work more closely together. Thank you, Valeria, Oleg, and Mariana for your strong leadership during this incredibly difficult time. And thank you, Nancy, for joining us and speaking with us on this very important day for Ukraine. Я думаю, ми можемо передати слово, так, чи хтось хотів оголосити. Да, тепер, Ненсі, ми запрошуємо вас і дуже раді, що ви сьогодні будете з нами. Це на ваше. It's my honor to speak at the invitation of the National Psychological Association of Ukraine, as my Ukrainian colleagues continue to face frightening, demoralizing, and traumatic challenges to your work, challenges for which your training as mental health professionals could not possibly have prepared you. We know as psychologists that anniversaries matter greatly. And this is a very sad one. I am touched that the psychologists who asked me to give this talk, Mariana Velikodna and Alexander Lupus and their colleagues on the board of NPA feel I will have something to say to you that might be valuable in the face of the terrible conditions you have been practicing under during the past year. I am experiencing a certain amount of imposter syndrome, a feeling that I have no standing to give this talk, no legitimate claim to expertise in conducting a clinical practice during the agony of war. I have been blessed with peace for my whole long lifetime. And although I have consulted to therapists facing horrific conditions, I have never had to cope with what you are facing, violent deaths and injuries, the destruction of communities, the tearing apart of families, widespread and often involuntary dislocations, and terror. The knowledge that however bad things are now, they could get worse. I feel a bit like a general family physician who is asked to speak to a group of active battlefield medics, doctors under enemy fire, who have to make one after another life and death choice about how to reduce the damage of war in emergency circumstances when standard medical care is out of the question. I have not been tested in such conditions and I do not know how brave or resilient I would be. So please understand that I am not claiming personal wisdom about coping with the conditions in which you are now working. I have never been a refugee or seen my community devastated by military attack, but I do know something about trauma, about bearing feelings that seem unbearable, about mourning, about self-care for therapists, and about finding meaning and even satisfaction in doing what is possible, even when much is impossible, when small clinical gains are dwarfed by larger destructive forces that we as mental health professionals have very little power to influence. For all of you, everything changed one year ago when the Russian army invaded your homeland. When I was in Kiev just over a decade ago, I was struck by the arch over the Dnipro River, a remnant of the USSR era, 
then proclaiming friendship between Ukrainians and Russians. I think about that sign often, about how political symbols and slogans are so frequently used in the service of denial of the strains and conflicts that simmer below the surface of national identities. At best, such symbols are aspirational. At worst, they are cynically manipulative. A below the surface vulnerability to fracturing along the lines of existing social tensions can be found in most societies, democratic and otherwise. In these times of rapid social change, when the internet can be used to promote lies and conspiracy theories, when we all feel anxiety about the future of the planet, when crimes of hate seem ubiquitous, even those of us who practice in comparatively peaceful circumstances worry about the fragility of ordinary conditions of safety and social predictability. Political scientists tell us that democracies are fragile, that they require the never-ending work of active citizenship to keep them healthy. And yet, when they work well, we tend to take them for granted until something exposes our existential vulnerability and imperils our previously secure attachments and expectations of predictability. In Ukraine, you have had no choice but to face up to one of the worst threats to any de democratic society, the catastrophe of armed invasion. In this criminal attack on your sovereignty, you have endured the violent imposition from outside your borders of an agenda whose outlines the Ukrainian people never endorsed in a military operation whose depredations you have been suffering for a year and whose future ramifications you dread. I am proud to be a clinical psychologist, but at the same time, I think of our profession as a modest one. Clinical practice is a bit like physical therapy for patients who have suffered terrible accidents. We cannot restore our clients to who they were before the disaster, but we can help them be the best version of who they can be in its aftermath. As therapists, we minister to souls maimed by trauma, poverty, addiction, crime, accident, and illness, one person or couple or family at a time. It is hard to have the heart for continuing to do this when the traumatic events that create long-term emotional suffering continue to happen at a breathtaking pace and involve previously unimaginable levels of destruction. Both we ourselves and our patients must cope with the effects of painful social conditions that we lack the power to alleviate. We all live lives that are subtly and often invisibly affected by the intergenerational transmission of trauma. This is particularly true for people living in the countries of Eastern Europe. In Ukraine, even in peacetime, you have long been affected by the downstream psychological consequences of the traumatic conditions faced by your grandparents and great-grandparents, famine, starvation, humiliation, subjugation. In the shadow of that larger reality, one can feel very small and ineffective as a therapist, as if a building has burned down and all one can do amid the ashes is make a shelter with some remaining bricks and boards. Today, I want to talk about three topics relevant to our beloved, valuable, but limited vocation. Accepting realistic vulnerability, upholding professional values in extreme situations, and self-care for therapists under chronic duress. First, accepting vulnerability. One of the hardest challenges in wartime is to be tough, stoic, and practical in the face of disaster. 
while at the same time making adequate room in one's life for acknowledging frailty and grief. We need to carry on while appreciating that surviving pain is not about being either hard or soft, but about being able to be both. In the shock of trauma, we need our defenses. Dissociation can be a life-saving capacity. But if we cannot put those defenses aside when we are away from the front lines, we will eventually pay a high psychological price. As psychologists, we need to remind ourselves and we need to spread the word to non-professionals as well, that blocking pain versus acknowledging pain is a false and destructive dichotomy. Sometimes we need our defenses, even primitive ones, and sometimes we need to suspend them. We know that living constantly in denial of our human fragility leads to accumulated emotional stresses that include mood disorders, eating disorders, addictions, dissociative reactions, behavior problems, difficulties in intimate relationships, and other long-term troubles. Therapists have often seen such problems among veterans of war, years and even decades after the fighting has ended. A special problem for therapists treating people who have suffered traumatic stress is vicarious traumatization. There is empirical as well as clinical evidence for this phenomenon, an occupational hazard that we must take seriously. Clinicians who listen to the narratives of the traumatic experiences of others or who sit with traumatized people who are incapable of putting into words what has happened to them, need relief and the anticipation of relief, especially if a patient's communications have triggered our own traumatic memories, either consciously or at a visceral level. These stories and nonverbal messages are hard to bear. In our professional roles, we struggle to remain open and sympathetic as patients fill our offices with their pain. With war-related experiences, we can scarcely tolerate hearing, as well as with ordinary complaints that we may privately see as trivial and time-wasting compared to so much truly grievous suffering. One of the more disappointing findings of scientific investigations into trauma is that we are all vulnerable to traumatic damage at any age. Having a warm family and a secure attachment in early life is a good basis for some resilience, but all of us, no matter how well-parented and schooled, can be psychologically undone by traumatic experience. Because of this reality, it behooves us to take preventive measures and to encourage our clients both to protect themselves from any stresses that are avoidable and to grieve those that are unavoidable. It seems to me that the main psychological challenge of being a therapist under traumatic conditions is accepting the painful reality that we can hope with own help with only a small part of what is ailing the people who come to us. We have to make decisions about who is depressed versus who is going through a terrible grief process. We have to provide a listening ear to those whose experience no one wants to hear. We have to continue to help with the portion of human misery that is explicitly psychological. We have to hope that despite the fact that we can alleviate only a small portion of anyone's suffering, the sufferer can find adequate resilience to recover in areas that are beyond our scope. Working in wartime, you can do your job, but it is not your job to shoulder all the weight of war. As Bismarck said about politics, psychotherapy is the art of the possible. I would add that the worst enemy of psychotherapy and psychotherapists is the fantasy of transformative cure rather than modest repair. I want to talk about the role of grief here, and I will have more to say about self-care shortly. One important way of avoiding mental health problems consequent to trauma is by making space to mourn. 
Although in contemporary parlance, we tend to equate grief and sadness with depression, the two states of mind are significantly different. They may be describable by exactly the same DSM criteria, and they sometimes overlap but the distinction between them lies in their subjective impact. In grief, the source of one's pain is in the world, whereas in depression, it is psychologically located in the self. This bad thing happened to me because I am flawed in some way. The clinically depressed person feels somehow responsible for the painful things that have happened. The bereaved and grieving person may rail against God, fate, or enemies, but does not attack the self and become paralyzed by a sense of personal defect. Let me expand on some differences between grief and depression. In grief, sorrow overtakes us in waves, one after the other. Each wave can flood us with a helpless sense of misery. But between the waves, we can function and even find some satisfactions in the life that goes on. Those waves of grief are set off by experiences that remind us of a lost person or situation, and they can disequilibrate us suddenly and dramatically. Those of you from bombed cities who have gone back to witness what has happened to your communities know this phenomenon all too well. In depression, in contrast, suffering is unrelenting. There are no waves. There is only unceasing deadness, drabness, meaninglessness. When we are depressed, we cannot imagine feeling any other way, and we cannot remember why we would once wake up looking forward to the day. One of the cruelest things about depression is that the sense of despair is relentless, chronic, and unrelieved by periods of respite. In states of grief, there are things we can do to feel better, such as listening to music, talking to a friend, going for a walk in a beautiful place, whatever we typically do to comfort ourselves. In depression, nothing we do relieves the pain. In fact, as therapists can attest, if a well-meaning individual comments to someone in a clinical depression, change your attitude, or just keep busy, or think about all the good things in your life, that will make things worse. The depressed person will feel painfully misunderstood. People who are given such pep talks often conclude from their inability to take advice like this that they are defective and they may feel even further alienated from the human community. Despite the similarity of their externally observable symptoms, there is considerable evidence that in many ways, grief is the opposite of depression, that much of what is healing in psychotherapy involves replacing depressive suffering with normal grief that can be worked through. The process of mourning, which all known human societies identify as a special state of mind and dignify with communal rituals, and which even other mammals and some birds can be observed enacting, is prophylactic against states of depression. In other words, if in the space between times when we must function ad adaptively, we do the work of mourning, we will be less likely to develop a long-term mood disorder or other psychopathology. In wartime, familiar grief rituals may be unavailable, but there may be creative ways of improvising. I remember a study done long ago in Israel of bereaved mothers whose sons had died in battle. These women came from two different subcultures one of which emphasized being strong and not succumbing to one's grief, while the other supported traditional mourning practices such as weeping, wailing, and tearing one's hair and garments. 
A couple of years after their losses, the women in the second group who had allowed themselves the full expression of their emotional devastation were doing significantly better psychologically than those in the first group who were still being stubbornly stoic, resisting opportunities to lean on others for comfort, refusing to process their losses. The women in that group showed signs of clinical depression. Notwithstanding some popular beliefs to that effect, mourning never reaches full closure. People who emerge slowly from overwhelming sorrow do not eventually come to an emotional endpoint in which they no longer feel the sadness associated with their losses. But their mood shifts from a disabling state of devastation into a familiar and even comfortable sadness when a memory of the lost person or object is evoked. In mourning, we move from shock and rage to eventual acceptance and adaptation. It is difficult to go through this process when traumatic events continue daily. It is virtually impossible to go through it without talking to others who can bear witness to one's pain. In ongoing traumatic stress, we need to be particularly attentive to our feelings, to respect what they tell us, and to process them as well as we can. In this context, I want to encourage you to challenge the weird Western European myth that expressing sorrow by weeping and seeking comfort is equivalent to losing control. As a psychoanalyst, I can't help wondering whether this conflation between emotional expression and loss of control derives from childhood experiences when it felt humiliating to cry, such as when we were punished by an authority to whom we did not want to give the satisfaction of showing how hurt we were. At age two or three, children may unconsciously compare crying to losing bladder or bowel control. This equation is not surprising in young children, but it surprises me when adults take for granted that feeling sorrow is tantamount to being infantile or losing it. As an affective process in adulthood, there is nothing weak about expressing feelings and nothing strong about having rigid defenses against them. Crying, nature's way of dealing with the neurotransmitters that accumulate under stress, is good for you. I suspect that in these times of shattering acts of war and disorienting experiences of dislocation, many of you have wept along with your patients. I hope that you regard this as an empathic and natural human response and that you are not chastising yourself for being unprofessional. If you did not show your tears in situations that evoke profound sadness, patients would get the toxic message that grown-ups should under all circumstances suppress their emotions. Not all sophisticated cultures have equated grieving with weakness or loss of control. In Homer's Odyssey, Ulysses weeps copiously again and again when his beloved comrades have died in battle. For those of you dealing with soldiers now, and those of you who will in the future be trying to help former soldiers and their families, it will be critical to convey with a sense of authority that there is no shame in processing the emotions that would have been very dangerous to feel on the battlefield. What people in states of denial or dissociation from pain tend contemptuously to call self-pity needs to be reconceptualized as normal and necessary grief. Not only is it not weak to find one's way into previously dissociated feelings, it is a challenging process that requires commitment and fortitude. In other words, what trauma survivors may experience as weakness needs to be cognitively reframed as strength. 
People who go through traumatic experience need help to shift slowly from identifying themselves as trauma victims to seeing themselves as complex human beings who happen to have been traumatized. When trauma is not processed, when emotions, cognitions, memories, and perceptions are not assimilated and integrated into the sense of who one is, it is the body that holds and expresses the traumatic events. As Bessel van der Kolk has memorably observed, the body keeps the score. Although we have limited empirical data about this phenomenon, many seasoned clinicians report that their patients with trauma histories are more likely to be diagnosed with autoimmune diseases than comparable patients without histories of significant adverse events. To prevent physical as well as emotional burnout, both we and the people we treat need to come to terms with painful and sometimes overwhelming realities. One tragic consequence of participating in combat is the condition that Jonathan Shea, who studied veterans of the war in Vietnam, has called moral injury. Perhaps the most disabling aftermath of war is living with the sense that one has violated one's moral code. Soldiers suffer with having killed or maimed people who were barely out of childhood, who were conscripted into fights they did not choose, who cried out for help as they died. Because most Ukrainians understand Russian, your soldiers are uninsulated against moral injury from the dying words of battlefield enemies who beg them for mercy or call out for their mothers as they leave the world of the living. Soldiers also suffer moral injury from witnessing harm to people they have come to love with the searing intensity that perhaps only fellow combatants can feel for one another. After war, people who have been in combat cannot square their battlefield behavior with the rules of conduct they deeply internalized before the war years. Because of the crimes they feel they have committed against their moral code, they feel evil, ugly, undeserving of help or care. They feel unworthy to have lived when so many people they imagine as morally superior have died. In wartime, combatants and non-combatants suffer gravely from witnessing trauma they could not prevent. They may have witnessed the excruciating deaths of people they loved and could not save. We know from post-war and child development research that the severest kind of traumatic injury is helpless witnessing and the moral injury that accompanies it. After the Second World War, psychologists learned that concentration camp inmates who had witnessed others being tortured had more trouble recovering psychologically than inmates who had themselves been tortured. Children who witness abuse of a sibling or parent have more long-term psychological problems than children who were themselves the object of abuse. At an intuitive level, this greater damage done by impotent witnessing rather than direct victimization may seem strange, and yet if you reflect on it, it makes emotional sense. If you are the target of mistreatment, you can hate, you can fight, you can unambivalently defend yourself or generate satisfying fantasies of revenge and retribution. If you witness another person's abuse, your emotional responses will be much more complicated you will feel a punishing guilt for being unable to stop the attack or defend the victim effectively, along with a sense of relief that it was the other person who was hurt, not you. Such experiences create a bottomless shame that can drive people toward any means they can find to dull the pain, including alcohol, other kinds of addiction, and withdrawal from family and friends. 
Therapists can help people, including former soldiers who have witnessed violence, by informing them about what psychological researchers have learned about being a bystander to harm. Letting them know about the studies revealing that their degree of suffering is expectable conveys to traumatized others that the alien notion that they have a right to their pain is reasonable. Without the knowledge that helpless witnessing is the worst kind of trauma, most people attack themselves for weakness or self-pity, attitudes to which they believe more obviously damaged people have a much greater moral claim. When this war ends, you will be dealing with its consequences for many years. You will hear stories of moral injury from former soldiers, medics, and volunteers. You will have to deal with a lot of skepticism about whether you can be of any help to them. Dismissive attitudes toward ourselves and our profession are always hard on therapists, and victims of war often devalue us, treating us as if we live on an alien planet where human evil is only an abstraction. People who have been on the front lines during war are unlikely to believe that therapists could have any real understanding of what they have been through, and they are right. But if you acknowledge frankly that you can't possibly fully imagine the hell they have experienced, if you invite them to try to educate you about it, if at the same time you convey confidence that you can help them to process emotional reactions that would have been suicidal for them to feel during combat, they may be grateful for your honesty and your respect for the transformative power of what they have undergone. Second topic, upholding our core values. In wartime, boundaries between the personal, the professional, and the political collapse. Our usual clinical work depends on a predictable holding environment, a third in the language of relational psychoanalysis. During times of armed conflict, such holding is no longer available or reliable. We are faced with unprecedented threats to survival itself, for ourselves, and for those we serve. It is tempting under such circumstances to ignore conventional clinical boundaries. And sometimes that is the right thing to do. Glenn Gabbard was once asked how to apply proper psychoanalytic technique to a patient who presented unique clinical challenges. He responded, when in doubt, be human. By that, he meant that as professionals, we should regard the better qualities of human beings compassion, respect, emotional honesty, as more weighty than the conventional rules of techniques or demands of manualized protocols. We need to be a bit more real with patients under extreme conditions. We need to acknowledge common experiences of dislocation and fear. We need to be more conversational. I imagine you have all found yourself crossing some conventional boundaries as you are faced with situations that are calamitous rather than commonplace. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. So I want to support your professional judgment in making decisions about what interventions with clients and what comportment with colleagues become legitimate under conditions of war. What I am referring to here involves behavior that would have looked excessive or unreasonable in peacetime, activities such as helping patients find a place to live, participating in grieving rituals with clients and their families, filling in for colleagues who are temporarily incapacitated by war-related events, and helping soldiers go back into battle when you know they will be re-traumatized. At the same time, I imagine that you struggle not to rationalize deviations from aspects of professional commitment that remain critical even in wartime. Confidentiality, integrity, and refusal to use one's patients or students for one's own personal benefit, even when traumatic situations complicate one's choices. 
In extreme situations, fantasies of the end of the world as we know it are common. It becomes easier to believe that since we are all going to die any minute, you and I can ignore the usual limits to become friends, lovers, or mutual caregivers. Our emotional life as human beings, if we can judge by common literary tropes and by the fantasies we hear in the consulting room, is replete with narratives of desperate situations that allow deviations from conventional morality. In World War II, there were a lot of war babies born to sexually conservative women who threw caution to the wind when they feared they would never see their boyfriends again. A baby is a blessing, but when apocalyptic scenarios are enacted in professional life, the outcome is usually not so blessed for either patient or therapist. Among professional values on which wartime exerts special stresses, the norm of confidentiality may present special challenges. Confidentiality is a cornerstone of clinical work, the sacred commitment that allows patients to feel safe enough to narrate shameful and even mortifying aspects of their lives. Our responsibility to protect our patients' privacy is one of the most rigorous demands our profession makes on us. It frustrates our need to gossip, to show off privileged knowledge, to complain about misunderstanding and mistreatment by others. The rule of confidentiality survives the death of a patient and it survives conditions of war perhaps especially during war. If clients cannot count on a therapist's commitment to keeping secrets disclosed in therapy, their last protection against emotional betrayal is obliterated. At a time when we all use the internet to post things immediately after they happen, it can be a brutal discipline to avoid talking about clients in ways that will identify them to others. We need to remind ourselves that once something is out there in cyberspace, it cannot be retrieved. I am sure there are situations in which the violation of confidentiality might be required in the service of a greater moral good, but I suspect that they're exceedingly rare, and I urge you to be careful in this area for your own sake and for your client's welfare. Confidentiality is an area I have had to work on improving Throughout my career, in my early days of practice, there was not yet in American psychology a norm of either getting patient permission or using extensive disguise when writing about therapy for professional readers. In the 1980s, I wrote an article for a professional journal about borderline psychology with clinical examples. It was unexpectedly read by one of my patients subject of the paper, a young man whose history and psychology I had depicted in detail. Because he was not in our field, I had assumed he would never read it. But unknown to me, he had a friend studying psychology whom he had told he was in treatment with me. This friend showed him my article. My words hurt my patient's feelings and compromised the progress he and I had made. All I could do when he confronted me was apologize, ask forgiveness, and tell him I would learn from my mistake. In the 1990s, I was speaking in Australia, and one of the clinicians there recognized the patient I was describing as emblematic of pathological narcissism. This therapist's path had crossed my patients when she had once visited the United States. I thought I had sufficiently disguised him. Evidently, I had been kidding myself about the adequacy of my disguise and the improbability that he would be recognized so far from home. I mentioned this to make the point that even oceans and continents do not reliably make it safe to be careless about confidentiality. I resent the limitations of confidentiality. Not only does it go against some of our natural human inclinations, but also Observing it strictly makes it hard to share our work honestly to our colleagues and students, something I deeply believe experienced therapists should do as mentors to the next generation. Yet, as I have grown in my capacity to respect the norm of confidentiality, 
and have accordingly sought permission from patients to talk or write about my work with them, or have disguised their material more thoroughly, or renounced my wish to disclose a particular but identifiable clinical experience, I have felt an increase in self-esteem that compensates for the irritations of having to keep this obligation in mind so ceaselessly. You need to talk with others about mutual burdens and challenges. I hope you can find ways to do so without risking betrayal of your patient's confidences. Even though Ukrainian psychologists are now scattered all over the world, the universe of Ukrainian clinicians is a small one. In small communities, confidentiality, as well as the general prohibition on exploiting patients and supervisees can be particularly complicated. I imagine that such professional concerns become even more problematic under conditions of war, but I encourage you not to rationalize deviations from those norms, even now, and to continue to pay attention to the values that the American Psychological Association has termed beneficence, fidelity, integrity, justice, and respect for people's rights and dignity. The moral universe does shift during wartime. Thou shalt not kill becomes thou must kill to prevent the destruction of self, family, comrades, community, and homeland. You have likely been and certainly will find yourself in the future in situations where normal rules of professionalism do not apply, where exceptional adaptations may be required. I recommend evaluating your professional decisions by two criteria. First, have you thought as much as the situation permits about the potential outcomes of each option at any choice point? Moral philosophers and evaluators of psychotherapy outcomes do not require us to make perfect decisions, but they do expect us to make informed, defensible decisions based on earnest, honest reflection on pros and cons. Second, is there anything in the behavior you are tempted toward that you would be reluctant to share with a colleague or mentor? If there is, you should push past that reluctance and talk to another professional or think again. Third topic, self-care. Soldiers manage to tolerate war because their attachments to comrades who endure it with them are deep and meaningful. As I implied earlier, bearing witness to that exceptional kind of love is part of a therapist's job. We can learn something from soldiers. Although we often practice alone, spending much of our time isolated in offices away from our colleagues, we need to support each other and depend on each other, especially in hard times. Consultations, peer groups, meetings with mentors, and meetings like this on Zoom, especially considering how the war has ejected you into other countries with different languages and customs, are all critical to emotional resilience. I have been told that there are a number of services available in to Ukrainian psychologists, which I want to mention here. First, the hotline of the National Psychological Association of Ukraine, where Ukrainian psychologists are available to help you with clinical and personal dilemmas. Second, the weekly groups for psychological support available to everyone, including psychologists that are conducted by the Ukrainian Union of Psychotherapists. And third, the project Psychologists at the Wars, which serves people in territories from which Russian invaders have been repelled after occupying them. There are other services as well that anyone on the board of NPA can let you know about. In addition, do not neglect to find ways to connect with groups that have given you support in the past, even if they are no longer near to you geographically. Most of them will have some internet accessibility. I'm thinking of religious organizations, interest groups, 12-step programs, and other sources of a sense of familiarity and belonging. The more losses you are confronting, the more attachments you are going to need. 
you spend your clinical time in active listening, an activity that is more emotionally draining than any non-therapist can imagine. You absorb the feelings of one after another broken person who is aggrieved or enraged or despairing or demanding or emotionally inaccessible. You need to be listened to as well. When peace comes, the suffering of your compatriots will not end. War divides people, not only because of relocation, but because of differences of opinion and loyalty that become incendiary in wartime. Families and groups fracture over questions of who fought and who did not, who was on the front lines and who was not, who collaborated with the enemy, who was in the resistance, and so on. Distinctions will be made about relative prestige of categories of victims. In the context of the Holocaust, Jack Drescher has written about what he calls hierarchies of suffering, the ways we may assign relative status to survivors. If you have a tattoo from Auschwitz, you are at the top of the victim hierarchy. If you survived any death camp, you have a high status. If you were in a work camp, you have slightly less prestige, and so on. Human beings have infinite ways to value and devalue. Our clinical commitment to compassion toward all suffering human beings, irrespective of where they have landed politically or how they behave during the war, will be an important counteractive to post-war divisions. Perhaps psychologists can contribute to post-war efforts comparable to the Truth and Reconciliation Project in South Africa after apartheid fell. In the current situation and in the years ahead, I'm asking you to make time to take care of yourselves as well as other people. The more resilient you are, the better it will be for your partners, families, friends, and patients. Don't martyr yourself when there's no realistic reward for martyrdom. It is not self-indulgent, even in wartime, to make space to enjoy whatever gives you small pleasures and emotional refueling. It is necessary. Therapists are famously bad at self-care. As a group, we seem to be highly subject to guilt and the sense of never having done enough. We help our guilt-ridden patients become able to see themselves more compassionately. We need to do the same for ourselves and each other. If you are a parent, find ways to enjoy your children. They deserve a childhood, even during a war. And you deserve to enjoy the pleasures and not just the stresses of parenthood. Take care of your bodies. If you sacrifice the body's needs to other demands, it will pay the price of your neglect and become the physical repository of your traumatic stress. Even in extreme situations, we need sleep, rest, and nourishment, or we will burn out and be of little use to ourselves and others. Attend to your ongoing health needs. Get dental care and regular medical screenings, even if you are far from your regular medical professionals. Find entertainments that take you away from the war, that remind you that while life is miserable and even horrific, it can also have moments of beauty, pleasure, and laughter. Speaking of laughter, I want to make a personal observation about Ukrainian politics. A few years ago, when you elected Volodymyr Zelensky to high office, many people, both inside and outside Ukraine, were dismissive of his political gravitas. So was I. What was a comedian doing running a country? Politics is a serious business. And yet, Mr. Zelensky seems to have risen to the demands of this catastrophe with an effectiveness one rarely sees. No leader is flawless, of course, and it is natural to complain about the limitations of anyone in authority. But it has occurred to me, as I've witnessed his tireless pursuit of aid and support for Ukraine, that a comic actor is exactly the right person to be in his current position. 
Comedy is all about exposing hard truths. Like psychotherapy, it is an art that requires a sensitive awareness of the subjective worlds of others. Comedians expose, in the, world, in the words of Christopher Bolas, our collective unthought known. The comedic voice, the voice that mocks human pretentiousness and skewers our hypocrisies, is exactly what we need in extreme circumstances. It is medicine for the soul, an antidote to the arrogant bullying we see in leaders who involve their own people and the citizens of other lands in brutal wars. Let me return to the predicament of psychologists and other mental health workers living with the Ukrainian disaster for a year and more now. The values and ethics that undergird our professional commitments are notably different from the power-related preoccupations that instigate wars. As individual therapists and members of ethically grounded helping professions, we need to exemplify values that contrast with the vain, arrogant, greedy, and evil attitudes that permeate the larger world and lay the groundwork for war. That is part of our job. But it is also simply a reality that we are limited in the degree to which we can contribute to any socially or politically effective counteractive to large-scale vanity, arrogance, greed, and evil. Political leadership is not part of our vocation. Rather, it is our job to help people close up and intimately by developing authentic personal relationships with them influenced by professional knowledge in which we listen to their stories, infer meaning, and attempt to mitigate their emotional pain in whatever ways are possible. For our own sakes and for our patients' sakes, we have to accept the limits of what we can do and be wise about what behavior is adequate to discharge our responsibility of care. And then we need to pat ourselves on the head, rest, and come back to work another day. At the beginning of this talk, I noted that ours is a humble but worthy calling. Let me end by paraphrasing the words of Alan Wheelis, describing in 1958 the virtues and limitations of psychotherapists. Living out their years in a climate of hatred and torment, they nevertheless maintain that life has meaning, that it can be understood, and that suffering is in part remediable. Though perhaps always slightly out of reach for ourselves, they believe love and closeness to be achievable. They make no claims for the greatness of their hearts. They are among the least of those who work beyond themselves. But to some extent, they lessen the man-made misery of man. They stand by. Hatred they endure and do not turn away. Love comes their way and they are not seduced. They are the listeners, but they listen with unwavering intent and their silence is not cold. Thank you for listening. May the war be over soon. And may you all survive it and recover with a new realization of your capabilities and of the value of our work, even under the gravest of handicaps. Nancy. Дуже, дуже дякую вам за вашу, у мене не повертається язик назвати це лекцією, за вашу таку промову від серця, яка дуже, знаєте, так лягає на серця багатьох українців, які слухають вас сьогодні. І перед тим, як ми перейдемо до блоку із запитаннями від них, я хотіла б озвучити, ну, озвучити, що дуже багато 
повідомлень, є повідомленнями подяки за те, що ви є, розділили цей час і цей день з нами. І це правда значить дуже багато для е, великої спільноти психологів. І як е, мені подобається думати, що через такі, е, знаєте, події, через такі е, ділення, через е, такі слова ви торкаєтеся не лише тих українців, які вас е, слухають, але і тих українців, з якими працюють ті, хто вас слухає. Тому дуже вам Вдячна за це, і е, як і всі наші е, члени, і е, е, всі, хто доєднався до сьогоднішньої трансляції, бо вона є відкритою. Тому е, якщо е, хтось із колег не бажає чогось доповнити, я думаю, що ми можемо перейти до блоку запитань. Так, да? супер. Добре, то запитань маємо багато, деякі з них е, е, трошки е, е, задублюють ту інформацію, яку ви озвучили пізніше, ніж запитання було задане, тому, можливо, на деякі запитання це буде короткий референс mm-hmm. до е, вашої лекції да, або нагадування, що ви вже про це е, говорили, а деякі запитання можна розглянути детальніше, так, щоб ми орієнтувалися за час. Часом зараз їх 11, то починаємо з першого. Пані Дар'я Тарасюк питає, Ненсі, будь ласка, скажіть, як боротися з втратами і тригерами у вигляді минулих подій, наприклад, мерці на землі? Я так розумію, що це певні тіла побачені або якісь свідчення таких важких подій. I am not an expert on this, um, but I would advise that uh, first you look away when you can, because traumatic images can fill your mind, fill your memory, and can present themselves as post-traumatic flashbacks to you. You can't always look away. Um, but where you can look away. Second, uh, talk to somebody. When you give words to things, when you tell someone what you've witnessed, the power of it starts to diminish a bit, especially if you are in a place where you can process the emotions that go with it, the horror uh, that, that goes with seeing any kind of mangling or gory um, disaster of which human beings are all too capable. About triggers, you can try to avoid them, but one of the problems of being psychotherapists is that we do get re-triggered. Um, we have to listen to people. Um, it, it's, it's, you, you might have to sometimes ask your patient to give you a minute because You're just taking in what they're saying and you're being bombarded by your own traumatic memories. That's not an unprofessional thing to do. It's a human thing to communicate that we all suffer with post-traumatic uh, phenomena after what we've been through. Um, so give your own experience the dignity of treating yourself like someone who deserves to be listened to, paid attention to, protected from whatever you can protect yourself from and uh, understood and condoled with when you can't protect yourself from this suffering. Дуже дякую за вашу відповідь. А наступне питання від а, пані а, Ксенії Широкової. А, чи люди з розладами так само проживають стрес від війни і подібних криз, як умовно здорові? Яка різниця і чим вона може бути зумовлена? Я 
I'm not sure I understand the question, um, but I'll answer what I what I can say about what I think is the question. Um, we know that the more adverse childhood experiences you have, the more likely you are to develop a psychotic disorder, an addictive disorder, a personality disorder, in other words, a dissociative disorder, in other words, all of the all of the more severe psychological conditions. I don't think we have research on war specifically, but the implications of the research that we do have on adverse events in childhood, which are now looking to be much more critical to later psychopathology than some of the biologically based genetic explanations that we've often wanted to give to such phenomena. Um, we need to protect children from those experiences when we can. And that, that, can, that can present some problems to parents. Uh, it's hard to talk to your children about war. It's hard when they're prematurely exposed to the depredations of war. Um, to whatever extent you can make your child's life less adverse, you will be doing them a very long-term favor. And you will have to cope with something in yourself sometimes when you succeed. Um, if you succeed in giving your child a less traumatic experience than you have had, you will find yourself envying the child when they take for granted that they were protected and that life is better than it was for you. That's why parents sometimes yell at their children, you have no idea what it's like to you know, try not to do that. Try to just be conscious of your envy of the child that you succeeded in protecting them to some degree. But we, we do know that adverse experiences correlate very strongly with later psychopathology. Дякую дуже за вашу відповідь. Наступні два питання я зачитаю одне за одним, бо мені здається, що вони стосуються дуже схожих речей. То Ольга Матюшок питає, як допомогти собі та клієнтам проживати дати роковини, наприклад, як сьогодні, або роковини смерті близької людини. І Олеся Марченко питає, Хотілося б почути думку Ненсі в контексті процесу ретравматизації через безкінечні повторювання відеоматеріалів відвертого змісту страшних подій на телебаченні. Чи корисно це зараз? Uh, let me answer the second question first. I think it is not useful to do this. Just as if you have a patient with a dissociative disorder, you want to tell them, are you sure you want to watch a movie about Sybil? I don't think so. It's just going to be re-triggering. Uh, the way the brain works, you don't want to um, inure yourself uh, to repetitive images of horror. Uh, it, it makes us cruel to do that. And it also, if, 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 it does, if we don't become cruel, we just become re-triggered. So uh, I would advise against um, watching again and again an experience that's traumatically upsetting. And if you catch your kids doing it, change the channel. Um, about symbolic days, there was a lot of research uh, in the 1960s and 70s about anniversary reactions, and they are extremely powerful. It seems that the unconscious keeps very good time. Uh, 
a study done in Chicago found that uh, one of the most common times when people come for psychotherapy is on the anniversary of a loss when or when they reach the age that a parent was when the parent died or when a child reaches the age that they were when they underwent some childhood trauma. Um, and this is not usually conscious. Uh, something is activated in them that knows that this time matters. For myself, I was astonished by this. I had a personal experience with the way that the unconscious processes keep time. When I was 44 years old, my second daughter was nine. My mother died at 44 years old when I, the second daughter in my family, was nine. So that year when I turned 44 and my daughter was nine, I sank into a low level depression. It was, it was mild, but I just, I woke up feeling blue every day. And I was thinking, I know this has something to do with, with reaching this age and with my daughter reminding me of how young I was when I lost my mother. Um, and it was good that I knew that because it helped me to comfort myself and do things for myself, which I would advise you to do on any anniversary. But what astonished me was that one day I woke up and I found myself in my usual state of relative optimism and looking forward to the day. The depression had gone and that I had no explanation for why it would have gone. And it occurred to me to check to see how many days past my 44th birthday I was and how many days past it my mother was when she died. So I calculated from her birthday and her day of death and realized that I had just gone one day past her, the age of her death down to the day. So anniversaries are profoundly important. That's why this day is profoundly important. And the more you can honor them, the better. The more you can be conscious of them, the better. If you lost a loved one in the war on a particular day, you're going to hurt on that day every year. And you should honor that. You should remember. You should, you should comfort yourself. Дякую. І е, дуже схоже питання е, також е, задає Маргарита Гутиря. Е, вона питає, е, каже, що сьогодні деякі українці відчувають потребу ділитися у соціальних медіа своїми історіями, фото, відео першого дня війни, перших днів війни. Чи може це працювати mm -hmm. як е, процес горювання – чи е, переживання втрати, або як процес, що ретравматизує? I think individual people need to make decisions about whether it's traumatizing to them, but in general, I think it's part of a necessary grieving process. The same way in many uh, religious communities, uh, you want to look at the body of the dead person to, to, to remind yourself this has really happened. They were alive, now they're dead. You know, Kiev used to look like this, now it looks like this. Uh, I think that's part of the grief process. And for most people, it's a healthy process. If people find themselves having post-traumatic reactions to it, then they should try to take care of that and not over expose themselves. But in general, I think it's a positive thing. 
Дуже дякую. Ще одне питання маємо знову від пані Дар'ї Тарасюк. Чи, може, чи можуть після гострого стресу з'явитись такі наслідки, як знецінення проблем інших? Дякую, mm. uh, Дар'я. Це дуже добре питання. Я kind of touched on that in the talk, that we have to be careful if we've gone through terrible experiences, not to feel scorn for the fact that our patients or our friends or our children are very upset by things that we think of as trivial in contrast to this. And if any of you have been brought up by people who told you that your suffering you know, is nothing compared to the way they suffered, you know that it's just not helpful to hear that. Um, it's, there's not a sort of a scale of justice of the amount of, uh, of bad experience that qualifies as, as suffering. I mean, people sometimes suffer over things that look incredibly trivial. I remember an elderly woman that I treated who was absolutely devastated that her canary, who had lived a long life for a canary, a little bird, had died. And I thought, you're, you're going to be mourning a canary? But in the context of this patient, that was her last friend. So we always have to stretch our empathy even when we find ourselves having that internal reaction of devaluation. Дуже дякую за вашу відповідь. Відповідь. Наступні два питання також вирішила об'єднати, бо одне є таким більш широким від пані Кузенкової Ірини. Як впоратися з наслідками травматичної ситуації? Да, таке загальне питання, але трошечки більш точне е, питання є від пані Ліни, на жаль, прізвище не бачу, е, через повномасштабне вторгнення у деяких людей відбулася втрата внутрішніх опор та цінностей життя. Як жити та знайти нові цінності, якщо старі вже не актуальні, а нових людина ще не набула? a hard question to answer um, without the specifics of the kinds of values the person is talking about. Um, I suppose it's a normal lifelong task to reevaluate our values. And uh, we've seen this, those of us who do psychotherapy have often seen that patients sometimes feel kind of unanchored or, or uh, floating between where they used to be and some future pattern that makes more sense to them. You know, so there's a period in psychotherapy when you kind of lose your old solutions, um, but you don't really have new ones yet, and you feel very untethered. Uh, I can imagine that that is even worse in war. Uh, when so much is so destroyed. Um, ab about the question of, in general, reacting to severe trauma, my bias as a psychologist is that you should talk about it. Um, partly this is a result of um, my growing up at a time when there were a lot of survivors of the Holocaust in the city where I was practicing psychoanalysis. Um, and I tended to treat their children. And the children talked about growing up in families where no one ever talked about the war, the concentration camps, the, the Nazi damages to their families, the destruction of their aunts, uncles, grandparents, uh, cousins. Um, and the not talking was very hard on people. But at the same time, 
I don't know whether if I went through that, I would be able to talk. <laughs> I, it was such a common reaction that families did not talk about this. Even psychoanalysts did not talk about this. I recently interviewed um, Otto Kernberg, who, um, who is a refugee from the Nazis in Vienna. He left at the age of 11. And uh, Tom Kohut, who is the son of Heinz Kohut, who was also a refugee from Vienna. And uh, they talked about how very few psychoanalysts have even talked about personal experiences of the Holocaust. There are a few notable exceptions, and Otto Kernberg is one. Um, but there must be a profound human need for that silence if that's such a common reaction, even among people who believe in the talking cure. So I, again, I don't feel like an expert on this. I think we all have to find our way with this. Дуже дякую за відповідь. Наступне питання маємо від пані Али Тимчак. Як знизити тривожність вагітних жінок під час війни? Жінки знаходяться далеко від дій, а тривожність у багатьох висока. Yes, I would put a big priority on trying to help pregnant women because we know now that if you're saturated with stress hormones, it does have an effect on your baby. Not to mention that um, the woman herself deserves the, the kind of care that in uh, non-war time we would all extend to a pregnant woman. So I would just urge psychological communities to make a priority of trying to be useful to pregnant women, trying to put them in situations where they have resources, where they're safe, um, try to problem solve with them about what their options will be after the birth, uh, try to get them comfortable with whatever is going to be their situation in giving birth. There are so many reasons for anxiety during pregnancy that adding wartime to them can really take people over the edge. But the more you can help them calm down, the better. Whatever works, you know, your CBT exercises, your breathing exercises, your um, soothing yourself with music, with hot baths, with anything uh, will be valuable. Дуже дякую, пані Ненці. Я знаю, що це питання пані Алла надає із своєї особистої практики. Вона опікується найменшими українчиками, зараз ще не народженими. Її за це дуже велика шана і подяка. Наступне питання маємо від пані Роксани Бочковської-Ящук. В суспільстві є присутність розділеності, хто був там, де гаряче, і хто ні, хто поїхав, і хто залишився. Як Ненці yeah. бачить цей процес, і що може допомогти нашому суспільству об'єднатися? Сам лідершіп є for для this is where whoever is your political leader is going to be of importance and whoever is leading your professional organization is going to be of importance because we all like to feel superior morally to other people and we are all tempted into what melanie klein called the paranoid schizoid position you explain your situation by blaming somebody um we need to do what the South Africans did and try to exemplify um, the belief that all people have reasons we cannot fully comprehend for why they did. It doesn't mean we have to like them. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, in some cases we probably have to imprison them, uh, but it, it doesn't mean that we have to make them into non human. Uh, paragons of evil. Uh, this is where our professional values will help us eventually. 
but you need leadership for this. Uh, I watched I watched t- terrible things happen in the United States when we shifted from uh, a, a leader like Obama, who was trying to be respectful to everybody that he uh, encountered, to a leader like Donald Trump, whose um, main uh, reaction to any problem was to throw blame at it. Uh, and and it, when you have a leader that throws blame, um, you end up increasing the divisions that are already below the surface in a society. So to whatever extent you can embody uh, uh, what Klein called the depressive position, the understanding that other people have different subjectivities and that you have to uh, honor them as separate and different, uh, you got to try. Дякую, you дуже. Маємо ще одне питання із попередньо написаних. І далі, якщо, колеги, я бачу, що ще кілька питань в чаті з'явилось, тому якщо буде у нас ще хвилинка, я їх задам, але якщо ні, то це буде останнє питання на сьогодні. Пані Ірина okay. Савченко питає про російські налаштованих клієнтів значно поменшало. Однак, чи чесно з ними працювати в якості психолога і чи варто зберігати конфіденційність такого клієнту, якщо озвучена готовність до колаборації? Дуже таке непросте питання пані Ірина поставила. Yes, and I, I feel like I'm being a... Um some kind of wimp to dodge this question, but I have never been in that situation. I don't know what I would do if I had a a Russian sympathizer for a patient and I learned from that patient some secret that would help the war effort. I just don't know. I just don't know. I I think you have to, that's why I came in on the side of using your best judgment because war puts you in situations you can't ever imagine. I mean, it's hard enough for me uh, as a therapist to work with patients who have profoundly different political beliefs from mine, but the survival of my country is not depending on that knowledge uh, that they have. So I could say, well, you should never break confidentiality, but Honestly, I don't know. І я дуже дякую вам за чесну відповідь, і я думаю, що це питання прийшло, знаєте, з такого самого місця, що ми зараз стикаємося з дуже багатьма ситуаціями, де ми не знаємо, що робити, бо для цього немає посібників, yeah. немає гайдлайнів. Uh, yeah. Тому <laughs> дякую вам за вашу позицію. Я думаю, що е, ваша е, порада е, прислухатися до себе і дивитися на ситуацію з позиції компетенції нашої такої внутрішньої і людської і професійної, да, це <laughs> єдине, на що ми можемо розраховувати. And talk to colleagues. О, oh, звичайно. Talk to colleagues. <laughs> да. Дуже дякую. Я думаю, що ми можемо підводити тут підсумок. Я дуже дякую вам за ваші запитання. Дуже багато подяки в чаті. Можливо, колеги, які заключне слово бажаєте озвучити. Перед тим, як дам вам це слово, окремо хочу подякувати нашим перекладачкам сьогодні, пані Юлії, пані Ірині, за їхню роботу і версію з перекладом. Ми додамо сьогодні трошки пізніше на канал НПА і всі зможуть ознайомитися і з перекладом, і з версією англійською мовою також, бо це теж буде зберігатися на каналі. Дуже велика вдячність Ненці вам за час, який ви нам приділили, за ту сердечну підтримку, яку ми відчули протягом цих а, полутора годин. 
це насправді для нас сьогодні є дуже підтримуючим і дуже важливим. Я дуже дякую всій команді організаторів, завдяки якій ми можемо сьогодні розмовляти, зустрічатися, розуміти один одного різними мовами. Дуже дякую нашим тренінг тім Ви неймовірні, ви робите дуже велику роботу, ми вас любимо і поважаємо. Ще раз, Ненсі, глибока вдячність і дякуємо за вашу мудрість і за ваш час. Thank you for having me.